Welcome back to week 4 of the course on constitutional studies. This week we turn to questions of citizenship, central questions to the interpretation and purpose of the constitution and continuing from last week and entry into the core texts of the constitution. Let's begin though with a quick recap on, on the course so far. In week one, we asked very broad questions in political theory and constitutional ideas. Why do we have a constitution? What purpose does it serve? Do you need a constitution even when you have a democracy? Is there any tension between the political principles of democracy and constitutionalism? In other words, when we have a electoral democracy that is fully functioning, do you need a constitution at all? So those were questions that we asked and addressed in week one. I will come back and post some further lectures and materials in week one uh, as we move along into week five. In week two, we asked how should we make a constitution? Assuming that a constitution is useful, how should we make it? Should we make it by simply uh, just adopting the best format that we find in the world or do we make a constitution that's specifically suited to the society in which we live in? Who should make it? Should it be made by experts? Should it be made by representatives? Should it just be made by parliament? This is a question that is of particular relevance when we think about the Indian constitution because the Indian constitution was made special representative assembly uh, which was diverse and quite uniquely representative of the Indian people at large. We also saw the process by which that constitution was made which is both deliberative and uh, consensual by and large. In week three we focused on the role of the preamble in the constitution. We, we stressed that the preamble is neither a simple introduction nor a preface. Some might say that the preamble is the spirit or the soul of the constitution. While not resorting to that kind of metaphorical description, we explored the purpose that a preamble can play in the constitution. We noticed that the preamble has a long history, uh, going way back in uh, the 50s, uh, years before independence, we looked at the Karachi resolution and we noticed that there might be even even older uh, antecedents to the preamble of the constitution of India. But most importantly, the preamble to the constitution settled some very core questions, core questions about the design of the Indian polity as well as some questions about the goals and purposes of the Indian polity and the constitution. We explored these ideas at length. What does it mean to create a, dem a sovereign democratic republic that is both socialist and secular? What does it mean to pursue justice, liberty, uh, fraternity, and so on? So we, these are questions we, we spent exploring. And this is what we spent some time exploring in the last week. And we concluded with a brief overview of how a preamble might be enforced. Can it be enforced by the courts? If so, can it be enforced directly or indirectly? What role does it play beyond the courts? How does it help us in our interpretation of the constitution? Helps public at large, as we know with the constant invocation of the preamble in public protests and in public readings. It can help legislators as well as bureaucrats who are interpreting the constitution and ordinary laws to recognize uh, what is the place of the preamble in the interpretation of those laws. So that was weeks one to three of this course and I trust that you've had the opportunity to see the lectures, um, look at the assignments and, and, and attempt them as well as to uh, use the discussion forum to clarify any doubts that you may have. In the weeks ahead, we will intensify uh, our engagement through these various fora 
and we look forward to hearing back from you as to what um, as to questions you might have, what's working, what's not, some active feedback, uh, so that we can all work together to make this course the best that it can be for the purposes that we have set out. In week four, we're going to turn to questions of citizenship. The broadest question that one might ask with citizenship is how should a political society decide who belongs to that political society? The question of membership in a political society uh, may, may at first blush seem to be an easy and not so important question. Uh, political society includes all those people who live in that political society. In organic small communities, these may not be difficult questions to determine. After all, we might know who our neighbors are. Uh, in, a, in a relatively easy sense, we might be able to name the, those who are resident in two, three or four streets around our homes. But do we know who resides in the city or the town that, we, that any of us are living in? Is there some accurate way in which we can count and name, identify the members who belong to that town or city uh, or, or, or residential enclave of any kind. How do we know that all those who reside are permanent members of that society or does it even matter? Are they members of that society in that they take its burdens and privileges? Is there some, some requirement that we must have before a person belongs to a political society? These are questions that are old questions in political theory and political philosophy and many answers have been offered to this whole problem. Citizenship is not simply the, the, the category of people who reside, it's the category of people who have special rights and privileges and duties in a political society. So this is the core question that we address. In part one, we will focus on the broad outlines of a response to this question by looking at concepts like use soli, use sanguinae, who are aliens, immigrants, refugees. Let's get our vocabulary going so that we have the basic concepts that can allow us to think about broader questions of citizenship. In part two of this lecture, I will focus on questions around Indian um, both constitutional and statutory provisions around citizenship. These are the two parts that I will focus in lecture one for week four. In lecture two, I will go into broader you know, controversies around these issues and conclude with a brief overview of the international law and approach to these questions. Come back to broader conceptual questions in part. So lecture two, of, which is this lecture, will focus on part one and part two. Uh, sections thinking about citizenship. Let's get started with the basic conceptual vocabulary to think about citizenship. Whenever we think about citizenship, we think that the key identifying document might be a passport. And you might notice that passports have come to stand uh, for so many things, both material and symbolic. They actually allow us to cross nation state boundaries, but above all, they also are emotional, uh, emotional symbols of attachment. Much like other national symbols, uh, the flag, the national anthem, um, passports seem to be the, that symbolic, uh, symbolic totem that, that citizens may carry to signify where they come from. Who is a citizen, first and foremost? A citizen is often defined as a person who belongs to a political society. He has full and equal membership to a political society. When we use the word political society here, it bears clarification that what we mean is the state, the Republic of India, as the passport suggests. One is a citizen, is a citizen of the Republic of India. So it is the connection 
between a person and a political entity called the state or the republic that citizenship signifies. When we say citizenship, we often carry with it the requirement that it is a full and equal membership. Not enough that some, some parties might have category 1 citizenship and other parties might have category 2 citizenship and so on and so forth. These kinds of models of differentiated citizenship were common in medieval and ancient societies across the world including in India. The, the, the requirement that we have full and equal uh, membership is a requirement in, in modern political societies and one that our constitution embraces. Hence, citizenship is a connection to the state. How do we decide who should have citizenship? Usually, all legal regimes in modern political societies, modern political states, will insist on a specific legal relationship an effective link between the individual and the state. Once you establish that effective link, then you can, uh, you can be entitled to some political rights, including the right to vote and the right to residence. What kind of link should be treated as an effective link? At the lowest level, one might say that residence is enough. At a much higher level, one might insist that someone might need to pay taxes or someone might need to have property in order to be a citizen. Modern political societies set lower requirements for achieving citizenship. But as we will see when we discuss more controversial questions, that this is not always obvious or settled. Who are non-citizens then? Non-citizens or aliens? Con you know, conversely to the definition of citizenship, we might treat non-citizens as persons who lack those very effective linkages with the state that they are located in. So we might be located or residing in one particular geographical state. But we might not have that effective link to that state in order to, to claim citizenship. For example, we may not be born in that state. Or secondly, we may not have lived long enough in that state. Or thirdly, we might, actually, we might live in one state but might enjoy the citizenship privileges of another state. And so on and so forth. So these kinds of persons who live in a geographical territory but don't have this necessary effective link are thought of as non-citizens or, or, or aliens. Now, non-citizens or aliens are not devoid of all political rights. We should not make the mistake of thinking that if someone is a non-citizen or an alien, that they are somehow a non-human being. They're, they're, they have no rights at all. They, they can't enjoy any legal rights and privileges and can be treated as a state wishes. That's often not the case. They usually enjoy civil and, and political and legal rights, but they will not enjoy the entire basket of civil, political and legal rights enjoyed by citizens. Non-citizens or aliens are sometimes called by various legal terms. They may be called permanent residents, they may be called migrants, they may be called refugees or asylum seekers, temporary visitors, stateless persons. Each one of these legal categories of non-citizens have a particular way in which they have either entered or become a part of that political society. And uh, while this, this particular lecture will not delve into each of the categories at length, for those of you who are curious, you must explore these questions um, in, in greater detail. Often, citizenship laws across the world are, have a reference to the concept of domicile 
and it helps at this very early stage in clarifying the vocabulary and concept of citizenship to be clear that domicile is a reference to a relationship between a person and a geographical uh, uh, area where one has a permanent home or a substantial connection, birth, residence, or marriage. So a social connection or a physical connection. Domicile often gets confused with concepts of citizenship in the history of legal language around this question. Questions of domicile emerged earlier and at a later stage the idea of citizenship emerges which, which absorbs some concepts of domicile uh, to craft a new constitutional idea of citizenship which is the primary idea that we are working so citizenship uh, is that full is full and equal membership in a political society that is conferred on someone who shows an effective connection to that political society. Very often we confuse ideas of citizenship and nationality as well. Nationality is about the connection between an individual and the nation, whereas citizenship is a legal category of membership. So let's let's explain with a few examples. We might, for example, think that our primary political identity is connected to our states. We might think of ourselves as first belonging, as in my case, to the state of Karnataka. This might be my primary political and social identity. And then I might say I am Indian as well. So these are ideas of belonging to a community and to ideas of, of, uh, of a political society. Right? This national idea or this, this uh, affinity, uh, 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 emotive connection to a social and national identity is not relevant to questions of citizenship in any direct sense because we might have multiple affinities and senses of belonging but we might have only one legal identity which is citizenship so citizenship is about legal membership status in a political society it is not a nationality test it is a it, it is a, a legal status that emerges out of our particular connections to a political society so national, what is striking about social scientific data that we have about national identity in India is that Indians are very comfortable assuming and affirming two identities or more identities related to their region or language and identities related to the nation that is India. We can be equally passionate about both these identities and in fully belong to the Indian nation. Membership status though, our legal citizenship and membership status is one. We remain, there are no regional uh, citizenships in India. So one is not a citizen of Karnataka, though one might be a resident of Karnataka or one might feel that one is uh, has an affinity to, the, to a Karnataka state identity. One remains a citizen of India. There is only one national citizenship in India. Okay. So keeping these concepts apart is very important. Uh, citizenship is about legal membership. Nationality is about our senses of collective identity. The conferral of rights is not on the basis of your national or regional identity. The conferral of rights is on the basis of our legal membership status. So even if one were not the most passionate about national identity, whether that is invested in a cricket team or hockey team, one, one still retains all the rights, the bundle of rights that is associated with our citizenship. Let's move on to consider how citizenship is either conferred uh, and, and on what are the kinds of criteria and models of citizenship that different nations follow. 
ordinarily citizenship is determined either exclusively or by a combination of these factors by birth or use soli and we are just using the, the original latin maxims for these ideas of citizenship by descent or use sanguinae or by naturalization let me explain each of these at some length and then we can we can take note how indian citizenship laws organized we may become citizens of a particular political society just by virtue of being born in that society there might be further conditions attached that we might, we may have to be born as well as have parents who are citizens of the country but in some countries around the world birth is enough is enough of a sufficient is a sufficient condition to confer national uh, citizenship in that country the second criteria is by descent i may not be born in a particular country but my parents may originate from a, from that country and on the basis of my the origin the national the national origin of my parents i might be able to claim citizenship in that country this kind of claim is called the jus sanguinae claim it's by it's by descent that one can claim um a uh, membership in that society the third process or the third mode by which citizenship may be acquired is through a process of naturalization naturalization often requires a certain number of years of residence and then the adoption of the citizenship of that political society these three modes of citizenship give give us a significant idea about the nature of the political society of which we have membership some some uh, political societies exclusively rely on one model of citizenship while other political societies are comfortable using a combination of these models india is one of the societies that uses a combination of these models while conferring citizenship on its, on its members on its residents you would recall that there have been significant recent debates about citizenship and political office uh, a few years ago there was a there was a debate in india whether the leader um, the president of the, the indian national congress uh, sonia gandhi who was born in italy and grew up there and acquired indian citizenship by through marriage uh, would was enough of an indian citizen to occupy high political office conversely there is now a, a debate in the united states about whether the vice presidential candidate kamala harris who has indian and west indian parentage so not by descent uh, 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 um and the of, of an american uh, citizen but was born in the united states should be able to claim a, the second highest political office in that country as we know the debate on the on the nature of citizenship around um, uh, sonia gandhi uh, meant that she for uh, didn't take up the leadership position when the early upa government one a majority in parliament now for kamala harris the question is not as significant uh, as barack obama who uh, became the president of the united states uh, had one parent whose who, whose place of origin was not the united states and so one might take it that the issue is relatively more settled in the united states though uh, these questions continue to boil up in all political societies especially loud democratic societies where this uh, these modes of expression are more common so one is acutely aware that questions of birth descent or naturalization remain questions 
are politically salient questions in many democracies. With that, I'll move on to part two of this lecture. In part two of this lecture, I'm going to focus on the nature of citizenship in the Indian constitution. Um, we will briefly go over the core provisions of the constitution uh, and notice very quickly that the constitution covers the power on parliament to legislate on areas of citizenship. We want to look at the requirements of non-discrimination in, in citizenship as well as the nature of fundamental rights claims that can be made by citizens and non-citizens. We will close with a broad overview of the Citizenship Act and what it allows. So let me begin by turning to the core provisions of the Constitution. One might imagine that the Indian Constitution settles the matter once and for all that it, there is a categorical commitment to a particular model of citizenship, use soli, use sanguinae, or naturalization, and the, the, that the constitution might settle the relationship between citizenship and national identity conclusively. However, a close reading of part two of the constitution, articles five to eleven, confirms that the constitution does sketch out some general principles of citizenship but does not settle all these questions decisively. Article 5, for example, makes it clear that at the time of the commencement of the constitution of India, that is 1950, all those who had domicile in the territory of India, who were either born in the territory of India born to parents who were born in the territory of India or who had been ordinarily resident for not less than five years would be treated as citizens of India. But this only settled the question of who were citizens in 1950. Notice that all three criteria are used. Born in the territory of India, descent from parents who are uh, born in the territory of India and ordinary residence, kind of a domicile criteria along with the process of naturalization might confer citizenship. So these questions um, are settled as far as 1950, we have an open and broad model of citizenship. But articles 6 to 10 then go on to really clarify for us what are the peculiar context, the peculiar political context. That, that was occurring at the time when the Indian constitution came into force in 1950 and namely the partition of India. So articles 6 to 10 were, were committed to sorting out who is a, 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 a citizen of India given that large uh, populations were moving across national boundaries at what was at that time uh, a common political territory of South Asia, which was partitioned into uh, Pakistan and India. So, 6 to 10 don't settle the questions of citizenship in a, in a sharp sense relevant to our contemporary questions. Article 11, on the other hand, confers a rather wide power on parliament to make laws relating to citizenship. And what is striking is that the Article 11 power allows Parliament to devise a model of citizenship that may that may even go uh, that need not even comply to Part Two of the Constitution. So a very wide and broad power of citizenship, and Parliament exercised that power to create the Citizenship Act of 1955. This power of creating the Citizenship Act uh, allowed Parliament to sketch out its own models of citizenship, which deserve a little bit of attention. What does the Citizenship Act of 1955 do? It tells us how we acquire citizenship, how we might lose citizenship, and if there are controversies about citizenship, how those controversies may be settled. 
It also makes clear that is the Citizenship Act of 1955 that only natural persons can be citizens. It does not allow corporations and other legal entities, um, non-human beings, to claim citizenship in India. For a for a broad uh, overview of the history and and debates around citizenship, uh, I recommend to you the book that is featured on this slide, uh, titled "Mapping Citizenship in India" by Anupama Roy, which gives you a broad uh, sweep analytical take on the evolution of these questions across this, the last 70 years of the Republic. There are some other books which I will also refer to uh, as we go along. Let's turn our attention to the Citizenship Act of 1955. As I mentioned, Article 5 of the Constitution allowed for a rather broad range of, um, of, of modes of acquiring citizenship. The Citizenship Act of 1955 continues in a similar way. It allows for citizenship by birth, which is Section 3. This is simple enough. It's a determination of a material fact. Either one is born in the country or not. Re do remember that birth by itself exclusively does not confer citizenship in India, there are some accompanying conditions, uh, including uh, places of origin. Let me read that for you. Uh, every person born in India on or after the 26th of January 1950, but before the commencement of the Citizenship Act, Amendment Act of 1986, yeah, shall be a citizen of India by birth. Now, if, your, if either of your parents is a citizen of India at the time of one's birth and you are born in India, you get citizenship in India. The Amendment Act 1986 is relevant because of all the issues around illegal migration that, the, that has exercised uh, you know, political attention over a period of time that now citizen that birth by itself even if uh, uh, parents have indian origin is insufficient for questions of citizenship and and i think that if some of the debates that we will discuss in part three of this uh, lecture or in in week four we will deal with some of the current controversies on this question the second requirement or the second possibility mode by which we might secure citizenship is by descent. Now, this is citizenship by descent is for those people who are born outside India, but who have parents who are who are of Indian origin and are Indian citizens. It is very important that uh, anyone who seeks to claim citizenship by descent registers at an Indian consulate between uh, within a year of birth to claim this this particular model mode of citizenship uh, Indian citizenship section 5 allows for citizenship by registration this is for uh, parties who are not uh, Indian citizenship Indian citizens by birth or by descent Usually, they are citizens who are of commonwealth origin, who, after a certain number of years of residence in India, or uh, persons of Indian origin, who, after five, uh, five years of residence in India, may claim citizenship. One tends to forget that commonwealth citizens have a special status, because India is a member of the commonwealth, but uh, Section 5 allows for these categories, um, Commonwealth uh, citizens as well as persons of Indian origin, to make a claim by going through a formal process of registration. Section 6 allows for a process of citizenship by naturalization. Naturalization requires far longer periods of residence. It, you might have no connection, you might not be a person of Indian origin, 
you might not be a, a commonwealth citizens but if you if you are able to reside in india for nine out of the preceding 12 years and for the preceding 12 months before uh, before you make your application and then um, uh, proclaim an oath of allegiance to the constitution the laws of the country you might you might become a citizen of india now naturalization is usually reserved for those parties who might enter india under peculiar conditions and then claim indian citizenship the last category that we want to look at is the process by which we might acquire citizenship due to the incorporation of a territory and let me just use two quick examples to illustrate this the the uh, in the inclusion of goa or pondicherry puducherry as it's now called into the territory of india gives its uh, gives the residents of uh, puducherry and of goa the the ability to claim indian citizenship um, through section 7 of the citizenship act now when you look on the on at the slide and look at the various modalities by which citizenship may be acquired you notice that this citizenship is acquired on a sliding scale of difficulty citizenship by birth is almost automatic uh, provided you satisfy section 3 citizenship by descent would require some further action um, by parties who want to claim it some registration then there is citizenship by registration which is has more onerous conditions that one must satisfy naturalization might it's a 12 year process or more and uh, incorporation of territory is a rather exceptional political event that occurs rarely in the history of the nation so one understands that the primary mo model by which citizenship is acquired in 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 india is by birth most of us who claim citizenship today claim citizenship on the basis of birth and there is a, a receding scale as we go down um, that column how can we lose citizenship let's turn to that briefly uh, and consider it we we might lose citizenship very simply by giving it up there is a model uh, by which we can declare that we give up the citizenship of india and as long as you place that the place that declaration in a requisite form one gives up citizenship you might lose it by default if you acquire citizenship in another country so now india could have adopted a model of dual citizenship whereby citizens could at one time be citizens of india and citizens of another country however that model has not been adopted and hence the the citizenship uh, just by virtue of acquiring the citizenship of another country you you are automatically deprived of the citizenship of india the citizenship act also permits the government under some special circumstances to deprive you of your citizenship uh, or your indian citizenship these are special circumstances and a specific procedure needs to be followed uh, but as you uh, you can tell with uh, the the ongoing controversies around citizenship in india these uh, provisions like section 10 may come to have a significant influence in the years to come international human rights law has a significant uh, investment on questions of citizenship while i'm not going to focus on international citizen uh, international human rights law at great length i want to capture the main the main ideas uh, that we must be familiar with when we think about citizenship in the indian constitution first the general principle for citizenship in india is that that citizenship must be uh, uh, citizenship sorry in international law is that citizenship must be granted on an equal and non discriminatory basis that that uh, uh, states must not make it so difficult to acquire citizenship that they render too many people stateless 
So the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights makes it clear that all persons, not just citizens, are equal before the law and entitled without any discrimination to the equal protection of the law. Now this requirement would mean that, uh, that asylum seekers, migrants, refugees would also be able to claim the protection of an equal treatment uh, um, requirement. This is made even clearer when, when the uh, Human Rights Committee in general comment 15 makes it clear that irrespective of one's nationality or statelessness and without discrimination between citizens and aliens, these covenants must be applied. Right? So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights call for this kind of broad treatment. The International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights also does not make a, a, a distinction on who might claim social and cultural rights. Non-citizens may also claim these social and economic rights uh, and cultural rights, sorry, social and cultural rights, not economic rights, uh, may be claimed by non-citizens. And it's important to note that we don't lapse into the kind of binary thinking where citizenship is an all or nothing bundle. Citizens have all kinds of protections. The moment you lose your citizenship, you have no protection. That's not how the law is configured on this question. You, one has significant rights and protections irrespective of one's citizenship standards. Now, the law, international law in this field is very well developed and very complicated on questions of migration and refugees. India's position with respect to migration and refugees has been very uh, accommodating in fact, but India has been reluctant to sign up to all of the uh, conventions and international law in this field. In any event, for the purposes of this course, I'm not going to dive into, uh, in, into the um, uh, international law in this, on these questions, but just alert you that the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights has produced a very useful document on the rights of non-citizens uh, in international law that you might want to refer if you want to explore these questions at greater length. As Indians uh, have, have, have a long tradition of my outward migration in, to, to seek work, whether that be in West Asia uh, or Europe, Canada and Australia, or, or increasingly in East Asia, it's very useful for us to have uh, an, an open and, uh, and, and, and you know, vital connection to thinking about problems of no, the protections of non-citizens. What kind of rights do citizens have and what kinds of rights do non-citizens have? We often tend to assume that citizens would have full protections and, and uh, non-citizens would have no fundamental rights. But on a closer scrutiny, we notice that Article 14, the right to equality in the Constitution, provides uh, equality before the law and equal protection of the laws to all persons, not only to citizens. So someone who is not a citizen of India can claim the protection of Article 14, equality protections. Articles 21 and 22 which protect life and personal liberty, and 22, which deals with arrest and detention, also applies to non-citizens. So someone who is, who is a refugee or a, a migrant to India can claim the protection of 21 and 22 uh, in the courts. Uh, religious freedoms, Articles 25, 27, 28, significant freedoms, on the right to practice and uh, profess religions. We will look at some of these freedoms in greater detail later in the course, as well as the right to constitutional remedies are guaranteed to non-citizens. So non-citizens have a way in which they can activate the constitution and activate legal and court protections to, to, uh, to sustain themselves in the country. And this is a very important way in which the constitution protects them. There is the question of whether legal entities, which are not natural persons, that is, co commercial entities, 
as in the case cited at the bottom of the slide, the state trading corporation case, whether they could claim these kinds of non-citizen rights uh, in the fundamental rights provisions and the courts have to a certain extent, extent allowed these kinds of private entities to claim fundamental rights protections. What are the rights exclusive to citizens? Some fundamental rights, for example, the article in 15 and 16 non-discrimination rights on the basis of, uh, of religion, race, caste, sex or place of birth are guaranteed to, to citizens only. Similarly, the Article 19 freedoms, the freedom of speech, peaceful assembly, association and so on are guaranteed only to citizens. So the fundamental rights chapter gets divided up into those kinds of provisions that are guaranteed to non-citizens and certain kinds of protections that are guaranteed only to citizens. But besides our fundamental rights, there are other constitutional rights that are guaranteed exclusively to citizens. These include the right to be registered to vote. As we noted in the very first slide of this lecture, the membership in a political society, one of its components, core components, is the right to vote. And, and uh, that right to vote is ex exclusively tied up to citizenship. Membership of the Lok Sabha and the state legislative assemblies as well as membership of key public offices are connected to citizenship. You cannot be, become the president of India or a judge of the Supreme Court and High Court unless you are an Indian citizen. But that citizenship is not tied to the place of birth as we had noted in the earlier controversies on this question. With that, we finish part one and part two of this lecture and, and we, we take a break here before we turn to part three. Let me recap that we focused on two broad lines of, uh, of discussion. First, we looked at the main concepts in citizenship, jus soli, jus sanguinae, as, as well as the related concepts of citizen, domicile and nationality or national identity. In part two, we focused on the place of citizenship in the Indian constitution. We noticed that article five did confer citizenship on those in, uh, who were either, um, um, who were residing in India, who were born uh, in India or born to people who, uh, who had Indian origin and or who had been residing in India for a certain period of time. But that was for 1950. Article 11 gives the gives parliament the power to make laws on citizenship and that is the citizenship act we noticed that the international human rights law gives a broad swathe of protections to non-citizens and that um, when we think about problems of citizenship we should not think in an either or binary sense as fundamental rights are are some fundamental rights are guaranteed to non-citizens, while some are exclusively guaranteed to citizens. And finally, that our political rights are very closely tied to citizenship, both the right to vote as well as the right to be a member of legislative assemblies and the high public offices are tied to us being citizens in India. So let me conclude there. When I come back for lecture two, I will talk about part three and part four of the ideas of citizenship and begin with the key battles around citizenship. So much for, uh, so, so look forward to seeing you um, in lecture two, you know, um, shortly.